So we're all Christian and we all has we all have one goal, and that is to reach to the fullness of Christ. And we all have, you know, one destination of this journey is to hit the ultimate dimensions of God. No, we don't want to just like babies going up there. We don't want to just know a little bit, but we want to know it all. So in Galatian, 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 Galatian chapter 2, verse 20, it speaks of an ultimate spiritual um, condition or situation. This is the ultimate. And this is what Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer lived, but Christ lives in me. So that sums up a lot. Right? It means the ultimate dimension of spirituality is that you no longer lived as yourself, but Christ lives in you. And I know that just, there's a lot of religions outside that is seeking for the same thing. They're trying to seek to that point where there is this absolute selflessness, and especially in Buddhism, they will meditate until they reach that emptiness, you know, and the four dimension of emptiness. All these things is just trying to show that they calm down themselves, because a lot of time, you know, shallow human beings are, are basically living in there with their egos. They don't even know what their true self is. They're living in their egos, and uh, a lot of things they feel, they react, they desire is all this kind of uh, lust and desire, but it's not the real self. It's all the egos. And therefore, all religions have the same kind of path. They're trying to lose themselves. They're trying to find that true self, and that true self is where everything is in the perfect equilibrium, and they will find that peace. But Christianity takes it one step further, actually two steps further. The first step further is we don't just lose ourselves, but we also want the fullness of Christ to manifest in us. Okay? And then that is not it. It says, and now the life, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the sons of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So basically, Christianity is first you lose yourself through the work of the cross because you say that I was crucified with Christ on the cross. It's all about the, the work of the cross. And everybody has to carry the cross. If you're a Christian, you will carry a cross somehow. If you're not carrying a cross, maybe you're not even a Christian. Because Jesus make it very plainly, you know, to enter the kingdom of God, you have to carry your cross and deny yourself. So first of all, through the work of the cross, we become this selflessness. We don't have too much of our self-ego, our own, own thought, own way, and we become like Christ. Christ lived it in us. And then we start living out a life that is not for ourselves, like normal people does, right? Normal people, they would just live for themselves. What kind of job I can get, what kind of house I can buy, you know? Just all this, everything is about them, right? But a true Christian, after they reach the spiritual dimension, they will want to live for what? For God. And what is living for God? So we're going to see about that. Okay, the second verses I want you guys to see is Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. And it's a very famous statement by Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay, so Christ is saying that, okay, learn from me. I am very humble, meek and humble, gentle. Okay. So basically, this self of Christ is very humble. And we learn from it from the other sermon that he, he was equal with God, but he humbled himself and down and died on the cross for us. So that's called true humility. True humility is selflessness, right? A true humility will not always think of themselves. And everything that happened to themselves, you know, they would not react so you know, critically. And you can tell, do you have this kind of humility? What is humility? Humility is totally, is something that is gentle. It won't have a, a hard spot. It won't have a, something to poke up. You know, like, like, like something look, that looks very, very peaceful, but if you step on their toe, or somehow you rub them the wrong way, and they will come up, you know, that is the kind of not gentle, 
because it's really not a humble thing. A humble thing is no matter how you rub it, how you talk to it, it will always be gentle. Okay? And sometimes don't judge me on that because I'm a pastor. Sometimes I will have to be stern and I may have to yell at you. That doesn't mean that I'm not humble. Okay? But don't put yourself as me. Because I was talking to one person and I was telling that person you know, not to yell at people. And then I was getting upset talking that, in that conversation. And that person was saying that, well, I was yelling at them just like you're yelling at me now. But that's different, okay? I'm a pastor. So, get, but get the point. What is humility? Humility is if somebody misunderstands you, it's not a big deal, right? If somebody hits you, if somebody afflicts pains on you, if somebody really scolds you, if somebody is troubling you, if somebody is picking on you, if somebody is attacking you for no reason at all, true humility, okay? would be like Christ, is meek and humble. So Christ will not fight back. Because the Bible literally said that he was being scolded upon, but he will not scold back, right? And people are hurting him, but he will not threaten back, right? He's like, I'm going to get you. I can't get you now, but I'm going to get you later. You know, that's called true humility. So you can see true humility have a lot to do with this selflessness. And this selflessness that Christ wants us to learn from him is for one purpose, not for his good, it's for our good. So we can be peace. We can have that perfect peace. You know, all the problem that you have is because your self is too big. You need to deny more of that self, then you won't have that problem anymore, right? Because normal people, when they live their life, they have all kinds of problems. When they're short of money, they, have, they, they will be frustrated. You know, if, if, if they lose a good position, they will, they will be frustrated. Uh, you know, they just, everything is about themselves. Every time when they lose something, you get frustrated. Every time when somebody wrongs you, you get frustrated. Every time somebody picks it, because it's all this self. But if you lose that self, you know, you're meek and humble like Christ, then you have that perfect peace because no matter what happens, it will not affect you. It will not stir you up. You're like sitting, you know, like a Buddha, you know on top of the lotus, right? You see that picture, right? So no matter what happened, even the storm comes and the Buddha is still sitting there. It's just an example, but it's the same principle that this ultimate spirituality which we are talking about is about selflessness. But it's not just selflessness because we need also to have Christ live in you. So the breaking of God in our life is not just trying to get you humble, you know, get you that you cannot do anything because you have nothing, because they strip you down completely, so you're okay, okay I can't do anything now. But that's, not, that's not the point. The point is, after it strips everything down from you, you will manifest that beauty and glory and powers of Christ. Not you, but Christ, okay? So now I get this pin point. If I get these two points right, and you guys understand that, we're going to enter into the real sermon. Because you have to understand that two point before you understand this real sermon. Okay, now here we start. Are you ready for the main course? John first, 1 to 8. Okay, the first chapter of John. And it's very, very famous scripture. Everybody knows it. Everybody can memorize it. If you don't memorize this, maybe you're just a brand new Christian. But if you are a three-month Christian, you will memorize this. It's very simple. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It was talking about this Christ thing, and you got all excited. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. So what you mean is, you know, all your cats and dog and your loved one at home, everything that you, you know, even your famous goldfish, you know, in the tanks, is all made through Him. And that's a real deep concept. It can have a sermon on its own. It's like everything is through Christ. All life is through Him. Therefore, the life of Christ is really for all things. So a selfless person, a self, selfish person, is always thinking about themselves, living for themselves. That is nothing to do with spirituality, right? So, true spirituality is selflessness. It's not living for yourself only, but living for others, right? I mean, you can hear this thing all over the place, uh, tell you how to live a very meaningful life. It's not living yourself for yourself but for others. But it's the same principle. Okay, now, 
verse 4. In him was life. Now let's get very theological now. And that life was the light of all mankind. Now that is a very strange statement. In God, it was his life. Okay? And when we think of life, we will think of, oh, I'm breathing, I'm living. I, you tap me, I feel something. Okay, I'm, I'm living because I, I, um, I'm living. You know, I'm moving. I'm jumping. So I'm living. If I have no life, I will be like sitting, like, you know, laying down like a vampire right? until midnight. So the point is, we have the concept of life like, like anybody that is, doesn't have life right here, you won't say that, right? We all have life. You would think, I won't, if I don't have life, I won't be sitting here, right? But right here, it is not talking about that kind of life. It says, there was a life in him. In him, there was life. And this life is the light. It's the light of all mankind. Now, if you don't have that light, you basically have no life. So there's a lot of people that are walking in darkness. In God, they are dead. But to them, they're very much alive. So sometimes we don't know we are alive or, or dead because sometimes we're walking in darkness, actually you're dead. But when you're walking in the light, when you're living in the light, then you're alive. So this, this concept of life is slightly different. And then, I was, we were watching about uh, uh, a movie. Hmm? Oh yeah, we signed a contract. Okay, we were watching a movie, uh, what do you call that? A movie review. Yeah, and we signed a contract that we should never talk about that in that movie. But anyway, I was going to make a point out of that, that, that characteristic. But I don't need to use that. There's all kinds of people like this. There's a lot of people who, like seemingly good, seemingly great. You know, as we watch a movie, we see a lot of great character. But actually, those characters is not that great. You really don't find a perfect character. The only perfect character is Christ. So, so being a Christian, we're not just trying to be selflessness. We're not just trying to be good. We're not just trying to be like, like, like the perfect man, the perfect guy. You know, that is not good enough. Sadly to say, that's not good enough. We have to be able to manifest that Christ. That is what the whole idea is about. This is how we're going to pass the final. Not just being good, not just have a lot of virtue, but we are going to manifest Christ. If you cannot manifest Christ, you basically have no life. If you have no life, that means you're living in darkness, you have no light. Okay? So, and verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So it's very clear that light will always overcome. Right? The light of God shines. If you shine light onto the darkness, there's no more darkness. Where is the darkness gone? There's no more darkness because the light takes over. Right? So that is really on the physics too, on the physics level. And life is also a power. It's a visible and an invisible power. The visible power is you see the light comes and it takes away the, the darkness. But the invisible, all the ray you know, that you cannot see with your visual eye, actually those are the power. The how intensive is that ray? If the ray is very intense, like X-ray, you no, know, or gamma ray is not is better. But the X-ray, everything, the ray gets stronger and stronger. Actually, it can literally kill you. Light itself can kill you. Talk about the powers of it. So we're going to get to that later. So now all this, all this in the beginning sums up that the life of Christ, the life is in Him, is basically the light of all mankind. If that light is shining upon you, then you're living. Then you have that life. If that light is not shining upon you, you're living in darkness, basically you have no life. And that's why, actually, uh, Peter and John, they all say that, you know, if we are the children of God, we are not walking in darkness. We're walking in light. So it is not what you claim, oh, I, I baptize or I go to church. It's not what you claim that you have make you Christian. It's are you a being living in the night, light. And what is darkness? All your frustration, all your anger, all your characteristic, all your, all your old self, 
All of those things is darkness. All your depressions, all your pridefulness, actually your depression is because of pridefulness. Because you have this sense of entitlement. You feel like you should not be like this. But now people are treating you like this. The situation is so bad. You know, you, you deserve better. That's why you have that depression. Now, if you don't think that you deserve better, what's well, a big deal, right? So it's like, like an old poor man. The only thing he got that day is one piece of bread. But he's, he's used to it, so he's eating it like peacefully. But if you are a, a, a very rich person, and that day that happened to be, you only have a piece of bread for you to eat, you feel very frustrated and say, gee, you know, I'm hungry. You know. Why is that? Because you feel like you deserve more. So all this is basically darkness. And when your son is, uh, is bad and it's like kicks a right? And then you feel upset. Why? Because you feel like you, have a, you should have a better son. And when your son, your, your son flung the test, you feel like your son should do better. You know, because I'm smart, so my son should be smart. It's all this ego stuff is doing. It's all darkness in the eyes of God. True light, when the light of Christ shines in you, you don't have any of this kind of stuff. You become like Christ. You think Christ will think like that? You think Christ will have that kind of frustration and anguish? You know? Right? You see, now you, you get in a concept about light and life and stuff. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the real thing now. Verse 6. Now, verse 6 is an introduction of John about himself. And uh, Paul has a very great introduction about himself. Remember that? Right? He's talking about himself as a, as a apostle. And he is a messenger that carrying all this chain, was being under bondage. And, uh, and from that introduction, you can kind of gauge how spiritual that person is. And if I'm going to have uh, Chris stand up and make an introduction of himself, and with a free line, just express himself, and it's pretty hard, right? And of course, everyone will try to say something good about themselves. Right? This is human nature. It's nothing wrong. Yeah, but from that <laughs> description of you, we, we will automatically, theologically, inject you and everything, like how much you really know God and how, much, how spiritual you are. So it's through that introduction. So this is John's introduction, and we can learn from it. It says that, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. It was pretty serious. But of course, we can say that too. Kylie can say that there was a man from God. His name yeah, is Kylie because he is from the Lord. We're all from the Lord. Okay? We, we, we get that part. But then he said that he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. Now, so he, this guy claims that he's coming over to testify for the light. And then we can say that, we can probably do that too. We come here to testify for Christ. No, but you misunderstand the point. What is true testimony? What is true test? The meaning of true testifying is that you are testifying something by showing forth something. Not just telling people, I saw that. For example, like we all know Yep Man and and he's so good in Wing Chun, and he's so good in martial art, right? So, so Wing Chun will come over, now Yet Man will come over and tell all these people who doesn't know anything about Kung Fu, he say, you know, Kung Fu is great. Kung Fu is mighty. And then people are looking at him, so yeah, huh? so what, what Kung Fu do? Or Kung Fu can take down a few person. Kung Fu can do this and that. And no matter how he talks, people will not be so convinced. Because these people never see, they don't even know what Kung Fu is. So until he really demonstrates the Kung Fu, then the people say, whoa, Kung Fu is good, right? You know that you have to show something beautifully and then people will be drawn to it. It's like this, this world has no music. Nobody has a tune in their ears, okay? And Beethoven comes over and Beethoven says, you know, music is beautiful. And he can talk about how beautiful it is. It will grab you. It will just, you know, arouse, arouse your emotion and you can say all kinds of stuff. And people will be looking at him, yeah, huh? Uh -huh. But if he play a piece, right, then people say, oh, yes, whoa, yeah, I want that music, right? So you need to have something to show forth. And this is what John, he has something to show forth. That's why I'm coming here to testify for Christ. It's like I'm coming here to show you Christ. Not just telling you about Christ. Because if I tell you about Christ, say, oh yeah, there was a guy like that, so, so what about it? Right? But if you show him, like I come over to this world of darkness and I start talking about ooh, light. 
Light is so good. If light comes, you know, the darkness will be fade away. You know, lump, the, 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 the light will overpower the darkness. But if I don't carry a light in myself, it's very hard to testify for light, right? right now, if I bring in this light, mm, see, see the light? I'm coming here to testify the light. So people say, oh, yeah, that is light. Oh, I, we want light. So the point is, we always have this thinking, a concept, like we can always testify something that we know. No. You can only really, truly testify in full something that you have, something that you can show, something that you can manifest to make it fair. So that's why when Jesus comes on earth and people is asking, can you show me the Father? And Jesus said, you don't have to see the Father. You look at me, you look at the Father. Why? Because Jesus Christ lived out the Father. Everything about the Father, he lives out. Not only that, oh, oh, Father is a very good characteristic man. He has a lot of virtue. No, the Father has a lot of miracles. So Jesus performed a lot of miracles. My Father is spiritual. My Father is supernatural. He's showing everything about God. Same thing as Paul. Paul said, I am no longer myself, I am Christ. And the people would say, so how is Christ like? Right? Paul showed them miracles. Look at all these miracles. Paul said, I'm in, among you, I'm not just talking. I'm demonstrating the authority, kingdom authority, demonstrating. So people know what, what God is. You know that the first century church, they are really filled with the powers of God. So they manifest that power. They're testifying for Christ, not just by talking Jesus like us. Now, nowadays, the church is just talking. Everything is about talk. Everything is about theology. We don't have anything to see, right? But in the first century church, they have the full power to testify how powerful this Jesus Christ is. And that's why Jesus Christ was telling all the disciples when he was being descended, he said, oh, ascended, he said, uh, okay, you guys have to wait in Jerusalem. Wait upon the power of the Spirit come. And then you will go and testify. Well, we always miss that part, okay? We're thinking we can just go. We can just go. Yes, you can go. You can always go and testify something. But Jesus Christ was trying to make sure, saying that, hey, don't go out now. Because right now, if you go outside, your testimony is not, it's in part. It, it, you really cannot represent me. I'm not just good in virtue. This God is not just dying for you and love you in the cross. I am the God of Almighty. I created the universe. I'm doing all these things. You know, now, now you cannot do that until the Holy Spirit power comes. And then the power did come in Pentecost. Then all the church rise up. Yes, now they preach in not just preach in testimony about saying that I saw Christ, but they live out that Christ. And that's why Paul was saying, yeah, I am. I am living out Christ. You want to see Christ? That's me. So, if you are testifying for Christ, you're preaching the gospel, and then people, some people come to you and say, show me Jesus. You show me Jesus, I'll believe it. Right? Would there, would there have been anybody that asked you like this? Have you ever encountered somebody? You keep talking about this God. Show me this God. Now, now if, you, if this same question is asked upon Jesus, he would say, yeah, you, you have seen it. I am him. Yeah, what you want to see, right? He has these full powers of God. And if this, if this question was asked to Paul, Paul would say the same thing. So what do you need to know? You know, he has this full kingdom power upon him, not just the word, and the miracle that testifying that God is real. The, is, the, the, the first century church is so powerful that the Bible said when they're walking under the hallway of Solomon, all the Gentiles was afraid of them because don't mess with these people. These people, when they talk about that God is really for real, because they heal the sick, they raise up, they, they, they rise up, uh, raise up the death, you know, and they have power to judge people. They can tell people to drop that, and people will drop that. And these people are very, very serious people. The supernatural power and the presence of God is completely upon them. So the first century church can say it. If they come in the first century church, and people say, "Show me God," and then I will believe. You know what the first century will do? The prophetic team will come in and they will prophesy and they will reveal everything in their heart and they will bow down on the floor as Paul is saying that, yes, God is really the money, you guys, because it's supernatural. When the people see the supernatural, they will understand that our God is really God. 
Therefore, others, there's a lot of religious outside that is very engaged in the spirituality and they have power. They have also spiritual power. And for some reason, Christianity is very, very like a lame duck in this dimension. I don't really know why. We are supposed to demonstrate the most powerful God Almighty. But yet, all we have is theology and talks, talks, talks. And we don't have this miracle to show them. And you expect those people to buy it? You expect those people to be, be committed to your God when their God seems like is more supernatural, more mystical? Right? Actually, they just didn't know that our God is the ultimate mystical and ultimate, I mean, ultimately supernatural. It's just they didn't know because, why didn't they know? Because the church fails to demonstrate Christ to that extent. And we think it's okay because everybody's like that. And now God gave us something different. Because this church is rising up in a miracle of power. And we're going to get to that later. But let's continue to read how cool John is. John is so darn cool. I'm totally in love with this man as I was reading him. Verse 7. Oh, oh verse 7. Uh, oh, no, verse 8. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Oh, that is so awesome. Think about it. Because he comes to the world of darkness and he shows forth that light. Whoa. And everybody say, whoa, that light. So just to make sure you guys don't get confused that I am the light because I'm showing forth the light, John makes sure, hey, I am not the light. I'm just coming here to testify for the light. Remember how Paul was doing so miraculous things that people are, and, and Peter too, and they, they were trying to like bow down before Paul and say, oh God, you know. And Paul, Paul and, and John, they turn off their, their clothes and say, no, we are not God. You know, don't be sticking. Yeah, we are powerful, but we are not God. We're just demonstrating power of God. This is a statement only for the spiritual person that can totally manifest Christ to speak. I tell you, a lot of church nowadays, a lot of Christian nowadays, even a lot of pastor nowadays, there's no need to say this word because nobody will mistake you for that light. Because you don't have a light to show. You don't have that power to show. So we know you're not God, right? If you have to tell people that I'm not God, I'm just demonstrating the power of God. You know, that guy must be, have something really cool. You don't have to say that because you're not demonstrating anything. We know you're nobody, okay? We know you're just you. Yeah, first century church, they're so powerful. A lot of times people think they're God, and they have to make that statement. No, no, we're not God. We're just demonstrating God. And this is something that we want the Washington, D.C., the, the producer come for this, uh, actually for this month, uh, end of this month where they come over to take all this testimony. And we want to make sure one thing. No, actually, we are smart, so we, we will make sure this thing. It's not us. We're just demonstrating the grace of God upon his church. We're nobody special. We, we're, not, we're not somebody, somebody who is very cool. It's just somehow God's mercy is upon us, his grace upon us. That's why all this miracle is happening among us and all glory to him. Not only, we're just testifying for the light. Don't mistaken that we are really, really monstrous, you know, powerful church. We are not, but the powers of God want to manifest in among this church because he is a powerful God. So, I really love John. He only comes as a witness to the light. So we understand how this light Life and light manifest through John is because John is no longer lived, but Christ lived it in him. It's just like Paul, it's just like the first century church. Whoever is going to manifest the light of God or the life of God, that person much reach, you know, or pass that final test, which is I live no longer for myself, right? And all those people will, that have this power will not live for themselves. If you live for yourself, you don't deserve to manifest God because God is a God that created all and He loves it all. 
And if you are no longer yourself but lifted in Him, you will automatically serve all instead of living a life that serves yourself. You get the point? Okay, and that all, all goes back, you know, when we Galatians uh, verse 20, uh, chapter 2, 20, it was saying, Now the life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the sons of God. And who loved me, who loved me and gave himself for me. So he will live a life that is compelled by the love of Christ. That is true spirituality. You know, if you somebody say they are very spiritual, it's very easy to tell. Is this guy always concerned about his own family, his own career, his own vacation, his own fun? Or is this guy really pouring out himself for others, right? Now, if this guy is very, just so much, so much about himself, if that ego is so big about himself, if all he's thinking about is himself, he doesn't even pass the final test, right? This is our final test. We've got to get on, on to it. And so when, when God is sending all kinds of situations to break you and to mow you and the way of the cross, what are you trying to do? Let go of yourself. Instead of getting frustrated, you know, trust in Him. Instead of complaining, you know, count His blessing. I mean, that's how you lose yourself. And when you deny yourself, you deny yourself, you deny yourself to a point like Christ did when it's rock bottom, then God is going to ascend you, right? And He's going to close you with His glory. He's going to close you with your spiritual gift so that you can manifest, not yourself, because yourself is already gone. You don't live for yourself anymore. Now you can manifest Christ, which is the light, and which is the life in Him, okay? Okay, I'm just going to wrap it up because I know time is going back uh, fast, just with one, um, one scripture. And this one will sum it up, if you see it. It's 1 John chapter 2, for first verse 5 to 10. Okay, it started very simple. Verse 5, uh, 1 John chapter 2. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Okay, this is a very, very simple statement. That if you say you love God, if you claim that you love God, if you claim that you are his children, you will obey his word. This is, the word of God is what dictates us. And his, the word of God is what giving us the marching order. If anybody say, oh, I'm spiritual, but they don't, they ignore the word of God, or they're not following the word of God, then he's a liar. This is what, what John is saying. So this is set up the very basic uh, Christian standard. And matter of fact, Jesus said it himself. Jesus said, whoever loves me will, will what? obey my saying, my teaching, right? So simple, obey the word of God is love to God, okay? And then he said that, verse 7, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old commandment is the message you have heard. Now, what is the old commandment? It's referring to what Jesus was saying that, you know, if you love me, if somebody claims he loves me, he will follow the word. So there is no real spiritual life if that person doesn't care about the Word of God or maybe is not cautious about the Word of God. If you don't have a desire for the Word of God, you are really in spiritual trouble. I see some of my friends uh, who left our church, and, I, and it's okay to leave our church. I don't care what, which church it goes to. But from the way they live, they lost the desire of the Word of God. You know, like they don't feel hungry to go to Sunday and to eat, right? And if they cannot find food in one place, they'll be hungry to find food for other places because this guy is hungry to eat the Word of God. If you lose that kind of appetite, if you lose that kind of desire, you're in deep trouble, spirituality speaking, in, in spiritually speaking. So, so this is an old commandment. John said, it. this is an old commandment, everybody should know that, okay? Now, let's talk about the new commandment, verse 8. Yet I am writing you a new commandment. Okay, so you have the old and you have the new. What is this new commandment? It's true 
is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Wow, that's the introduction for that commandment. It's like something very spectacular is coming, right? This, this new commandment is true in him and in you, seen in him and in you. It's like I'm not talking about something that is vague. I'm talking about something that is already being testified. I can see it in him and in you, okay? And this new commandment comes because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Now we say, what kind of new test, new commandment is that? We know the old one, right? like following his word. What is this new, new, new one? It comes like this. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Wow, that is a new commandment. I thought Jesus said it before he left. Did Jesus say that? I give you a, I need, I give you a commandment yeah. to love one another? Yeah. So why is this new? Why is this new? See, if you look at it, both commandments are old. Jesus said both of them. But now John said that that one was old. Now I'm giving this new one. You know why is this new? Because the church was in form when Jesus said it. The church was formed in the day of Pentecost. And this is way after Pentecost. When John wrote this, he's very mature and the church is growing. The church is manifesting that light of Christ. True light of Christ cannot be manifest by one person. I don't care how spiritual you are, you are not capable to manifest God in full. It takes the body of Christ to manifest Christ in full. So the church is there and they're doing a great job and to a point that John feel like, yep, yeah, mm, and we have light in here shining through just like him. And John was saying that I am the light and I have to tell people don't be stick me as the light because this light is really strong. And when John comes up with the church in the fellowship of saints, the church itself is manifesting full glory of Christ because the full gifts of the Holy Spirit is there. It's not just a God that has some kind of good literal you know, virtue. It's our, our God is not a God that is heaven that says you have to be good. You know, don't be bad, be good. You know, it's not like, it's just like that. He's the God Almighty. He's a mystical God. He's the God of supernatural. And the church is showing it. Christ was showing it because that is Christ's ministry. And the church is showing it because the church is showing, manifesting the Christ's ministry. You see the fullness of it? Do you see the contract between this and nowadays church? You don't see that kind of manifestation. We never have to convince people that we are not the light because they know you're not the light because you're not shining. They're not blinding their eyes. But the church is rising at that time. And this second commandment, the new commandment, actually is the old commandment, but now it's new. This new is becomes new because the darkness is passing. The light of Christ is shining through all these members and they are losing themselves. They're no longer themselves, but Christ lives in them. This Christ, this life, this light is very aggressive. It's possessive. When it comes upon you, darkness cannot overcome it. All the darkness of mankind is fading because this light is dominating the church. And the church is so dominated by the light of Christ, which is the life of Christ. They manifest it. It's shining through it. That's why this is the body of Christ. And that's why darkness is fading. And the light, true light is shining in the body of Christ. That's why Paul, uh, John wrote it very, put it very simply in short. If you love the brother, if you love the brother, there is no way for you to stumble. You know, we have hit the jackpot of the spiritual dimension because of all the supernatural dimension that we have. It's really amazing. We have more testimony than we can really list it out. I'm eagerly waiting for Washington, D.C. to come, and we'll give them a long interview, and we will show them the glory of God has returned back to this church. Yes, our church is small. When we, came, when we came over to Chinatown, we thought that we would grow in number because there's a whole bunch of Chinatown. 
China people. But no, our church grows small in size. And I was saying that, Lord, how come we have less and less people? And the Lord was asking me, do you want to have a very huge body, but got cancer in the kidney, and the liver is messing up, and a lot of ligaments on the leg is all messed up, a lot of joints, all the discs is kind of, you know, gone, you know, and this guy have arthritis, and this guy have this and that, and this guy, his head is kind of basically kind of wacko. You know, you have a really huge body, but filled with problem, or you want to have a younger body, little smaller body, but from head to toe, it's perfect, it's healthy. What would you have? Hmm? I would have a healthy body. Yeah. Who the hell want a big old body when there's all kind of crap is happening, right? You want to rather have something. It doesn't have to be big, but it's perfect, it's small, and that is called the spirit of the man child. That's why they call it a child. From the church, did not brought forth the man, you know. He brought forth a man child to dominate the world. Why is it man child? Because it's a very few number. But it doesn't take a lot. It only takes one Jesus. It only takes 12 disciples. And it takes only one Moses. It only takes one Elijah. It only takes one prophet in the entire generation. And God can manifest himself through that very small portion. God is not you know, so concerned about the size. He really cares about the spirit of the body of Christ. So I feel good. I say, okay. Maybe God's trying to just comfort me by saying this. But anyway, I kind of think it makes sense because I know that we are getting more and more you know, powerful. But it's not us. It's Him. It's all Him. It's all His glory. We're just nobody. But the point is, now He's saying that this oneness, if you love, you cannot stumble. Don't you like that? You know, because we're saying that, okay, Calvin, you're a very good man, but sometimes you're not so smart. So Calvin is always worried. Like, don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake. And actually, you know, you, you have that kind of like fear sometimes, right? Especially right now, the stake is so high, we don't want to mess up. And it's like the fourth quarter, and we have to make this shot, and it's a three-pointer. So we're going to play this really, really perfect and take the best shot. We're going to make this three-pointer, and we're going to win this championship. And it's like very, very tense, right? Nobody wants to make a mistake. So how can you not make a mistake just by this verse? First John chapter 2, verse 10. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Mm -hmm. I will stay in these verses because I don't want to stumble. Like if you have a lotto ticket that you win billions of dollars, you will hold tight to that piece of little paper. You will guard that piece of paper. Right? You can, you'd rather lose your car, you'd rather lose your house, but you don't want to lose that ticket. It's a little tiny thing. But it's not because of the size. And this is exactly what it is. When we talk about oneness, and how through oneness all these supernatural things happen. We're not talking about just unity. Church has been talking about unity for the last 20 years. Oh, not 20 years, 2,000 years. We're talking about a oneness where the spirit is one. The spirit are one. And we're not talking about love and brother and sister love each other, just a hug, you know, just everybody love. All the church, they would claim that they love each other. But this is the new commandment. This commandment only can happen when the darkness is fading away, when the light, when the true light is shining. And the true light is shining among us. This is the life, the light of God in full power, the Holy Spirit power in full spectrum. And under that light, under the spirit of oneness, there is no one who will stumble. Mm -hmm. If you have the powers of the atomic bomb or nuclear weapon, you won't care 
10,000 of the Swiss Army life, knife, right? You will not fight over 1,000 guns because you have something very, very great. And this is Paul saying that it's coming. And shining from John's time till now, I started to see it's not coming, it's here. So in this light, let us unite in this oneness, how God has revealed to us in this spiritual dimension where trifle prayer is going to come forth, is blessing, is plexing, is healing in intimacy and Zerubbabel, the anointing of Zerubbabel, spiritual mapping and all that good stuff is happening. And so, if you don't understand this sermon, you should go back and try to listen it. You know, I break it. It's like a many, many different parts in it, like seven parts in it. That's part of the work of the cross, the parts of selflessness and bring forth the true humility. And there is a part about the light and that life is the power that overcomes darkness. And it's, it comes upon like witnesses and it comes from a testimony of power. You know, it's like a circle. But if we want to sum it up, entitled this is called The True Light is Shining. The true light is shining. Indeed. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please make this difficult truth simple to us. For those who have ears to hear, because we have a heart to understand. And I know sometimes when we get too theological, we could lose ourselves, but Lord, we're just simple people. We just love you. And we want to do your will. But Lord, we do want to manifest your power and manifest your power in full because this is the time of millennium. We thank you because we didn't choose you, but you choose us. You're the one that put us in this highway of Jehovah. You're the one that shine light upon us and you're the one that enable us to shine you're the one that gives this little humble church so many testimony and, and miracles. You're the one. And we come to witness for you. Before we cannot witness, because we have none, now we can testify. Because you are shining through us. So we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.